Thank you for tuning in to this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And thanks to our incredible team for making all of this happen each and every week now that we're in this quarantine type situation. Uh, also want to um, thank all of our, our people who are still out there as essential workers uh, making things happen, uh, all, all the rescue uh, folks, uh, the, the police officers, everybody who, who still has to show up day in and day out, uh, and our truck drivers who keep bringing supplies to the stores that, that we all need. So, hey, the amazing thing is God is going to get us through this, and, and we're going to learn quite a bit from this. We are growing in the midst of adversity, and that's what this is all about is, is learning to, to grab those lessons. And we want to thank you as well today for uh, joining us once again. Uh, we, we've been able to see great things happen in the midst of this, as we mentioned just a moment ago. Our, our tech team and, and production team has been able to put out content every single day to engage and connect with you all and many others that maybe have never checked out Connections Church. So keep an eye out. More and more things are, are happening and going to be uh, uh, showing uh, up in your, your feed. So uh, be a part of that. Grow with us as we move through this together. And we want to, again, uh, let you know that, that today, the first Sunday in April 2020, we are going to finish up our current study entitled Stuck. And if you've missed any of this, you can go back and, and catch it all again. And, and, and even if you, you were with us the last several weeks, you can go back and, and you can refresh yourself because there's a lot of things. Pastor Scott brought the word last week. Powerful time. Uh, don't miss out on any of that. Go back and catch up. But this morning, right now, these few moments that we have together, I want to talk to you about something that is very powerful and something that we all have a tendency, if we're not careful, to get stuck in, and that is stuck in the past. God gave me this, this statement this past week as I was preparing for this, and, and it goes like this. The past holds a lot of things. Don't let it hold you. And we can get stuck as human beings in, in a lot of different things from our past. I, I came up with just a few I want to share with you very quickly. Number one, we can get stuck in a time frame. How many of you ever heard the phrase, those were the good old days, right? I mean, we've all heard it growing up, and, and a lot of people like to reminisce and think about times gone by when things seem to be better. There's a, there's a classic case of this in the Bible uh, with the children of Israel when God brought them out of Egyptian bondage and was leading them to the promised land. It's kind of funny. On the way to the promised land, they met with some obstacles, kind of like we are right now. They had some challenges come their way in making that journey. And, and the funny thing, which tends to be human nature too often, is that every time they met with a challenge, they would begin to do something that, that too many of us are guilty of, and that is grumble and complain. And then all of a sudden, the grumble and, grumbling and the complaints turned into, man, if we were only back in Egypt, we had it a lot better there. At least we knew we were going to eat every day and, and, and have fresh water and on and on and on. It's amazing to me that they remembered those good old days as being somewhat good, and yet they were in captivity during that time in Egypt, which leads to a couple of lessons, and that is sometimes we quickly forget that the good old days were not really that good. But even if they were, and man, we've all hopefully experienced some blessings and great seasons of life, even if they were, you can't go back and relive any of those times from the past. Although I think some people are trying to now because the mullet is coming back in men's hairstyle and God forbid that that catches on too widespread. But that's, that's for another time and another place. We can also get stuck on a person. How many of you ever seen that or maybe you've experienced it in your life? You, you met someone, maybe it was a dating relationship and that's typically kind of what it is. And classic example from God's word on that is, is Samson. And most everyone knows the story of Samson and Delilah. He got stuck on a woman he should have never had anything to do with because God's word specifically tells us don't be yoked together. Don't be bound together, believer with an unbeliever. And he went with this Delilah and got caught up in her. And, and, and the Bible goes on and tells us it cost him dearly. So please be very careful about who you get stuck on. Sometimes we get stuck in a failure. You ever, you ever failed in life? I, I know I have. We all have. Big, small, there's, there's a lot of failures that we've all encountered. And David, King David's life was, was no different. His was on the larger scale. 
when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He literally altered the course of his life forever. Because from that point in time on, David's life was never the same. I heard something many years ago, and it still rings true. Failure doesn't have to be fatal and rob you of your future. But for some, it seems to do that. For some, they never move past a failure in their lives. For some, they just can't seem to get by it and and get around it. Listen, the reality is that God can redeem our failures, and he can turn those things around for us if we just trust him with it and learn the lessons from the failure. Or what about a loss? We can all identify with this. Maybe it was a, a death of someone we love dearly, a family member, a friend, a spouse. Maybe it's a divorce that you've went through and you lost that relationship. Maybe it was a loss of a friendship, somebody you counted on, thought, man, they're going to be with me forever. We're going to be, be like this all the rest of our lives, but it didn't happen that way. So what happens too often is we experience a loss like that and we're never able to move on from that. And we kind of get just stuck in that period, in that time frame, in that, that place in our lives where we, we long for that person, we long for that relationship, we long for that situation to be like it was, but it never will be again. Or maybe it's been a hurt that you've experienced or possibly abuse. Beautiful, beautiful example of that is where we're going to kind of camp out for the next few moments, and that is in the life of a man named Joseph. His story is found in Genesis chapter 37 through 45, and we're going to be hitting various passages in and through those chapters. And, and here's a guy that we can learn quite a bit from, and we're going to. And I want to ask you this, this right up front. Is your future caged up in your past? Instead of being dragged down and locked up by guilt, pain, or a lingering sense of failure, what freedom could we find in breaking free from all of those burdens? You see, what happens is God takes our setbacks and he can turn them into comebacks. And he takes our disappointments and he turns them into his appointments. And he, and he could even take our misfortunes and turn them into ministry. I know I've lived that. I've experienced it in my own life, all of those things. And based on the life of Joseph, I just want to give you six principles for overcoming in the midst of any difficult that you find yourself in. Of all the people who could have gotten stuck from past hurts and abuse, Joseph had every reason to do just that. But look at me and listen to me. He didn't. He chose not to. He knew the secret of getting past that and moving on in his life to all that God had for him. And the first thing is simply this, that we've got to learn to connect to our God-given dreams. Now, I believe with all my heart that the Lord gives every child of God a dream, a set of gifts, a set of goals to follow. These unfold as we follow him step by step. And when we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, somewhere within us, there's a fire that that rages inside of us for what God wants us to do with our lives. I believe that with all my heart because I've lived that and I'm living that right now, even all these years later. I knew that God had a call on my life. I knew that when I, when I committed myself to him, I sensed him say, you're going to work for me. You're going to be in ministry. And I, I had that dream light up in my life. And it still does, and it still is. I believe that is true for every child of God, every follower of Christ, for Joseph. It happened when he was a teenager, and his story begins there in the 37th chapter in the 5th verse of Genesis where we, we read these words. Now, Joseph had a dream. Write that down. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, don't get out of the habit. Write this down. Joseph had a dream. And right out beside it, God, give me my dream or show me my dream. Reveal that to me. And it goes on and says, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, now listen to this dream. Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, all of us, binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. What a dream, huh? And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, you got to understand a little bit of the backdrop. They hated him already because he was his dad's favorite child, and his dad just poured favoritism all over him. And what happens is whenever that takes place in a family, I told you, man, this was a dysfunctional family. Whenever that takes place, then the other siblings are going to grow to hate the one that's getting all the attention and all the favoritism. And it was so true in this family. Now, he should have probably not shared that one with his brothers, but 
Then he had another dream, the Bible tells us. And it goes on, it says, and he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers as well. And he said, look, I have dreamed another dream. I'll bet that really made their day when he said that to them, right? I mean, come on, give me a break, little punk. Just quit telling us that you're going to be reigning over us. And so this time he said, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down? To the earth before you, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So Joseph, at a very young age, is connecting to his God-given dream. We're going to learn a couple lessons about that from what we just read, but I want to share this right now. Whatever you've got to do, whatever you have to do to find out your God-given dream, do it. Because when you find that out, life makes perfect sense. It's not always going to be perfect and easy, but what I'm saying is life makes sense. You realize why you were put on this planet. You understand what your purpose is. You see the vision that God has before you and why he created you and why he has you here living and breathing right now. So connect to your dream. But here's a couple of very important lessons. And the first one is this. We won't always understand our dreams at first. I mean, usually we don't. But sometimes they're very clear, but sometimes they're not so clear. In this case, they didn't really understand what was going on. They knew the heart of the dream that somehow, some way, that God was going to elevate Joseph and even his brothers and his family would come and give honor to him. Second thing we need to learn really quickly is this. Be careful with who you share your dreams with. His brothers already hated him, as we mentioned, because his father favored him big time. And so that probably wasn't the right audience to share with. But we're going to see that all this stuff worked out. And then thirdly, please realize this in your life early and often. They are dream cheerleaders and they are dream killers. Be careful to know the difference. Some people are going to applaud you. They're going to cheer you on. They're going to tell you, yeah, you can do whatever God's called you to do. They're going to be encouragers to you. While you know all too well in this cynical world that, that is growing ever more cynical, there are a lot of people that will not do that for you. There are a lot of people that are going to shoot holes in your dream. They're going to pull you back down. An old saying I heard many, many years ago, it's hard to soar with the eagles when you're running around with the turkeys, right? So you got to be careful. you got to know the difference between a, a dream cheerleader and a dream killer. But it all starts, once again, with connecting to your God-given dream. And then when we do that, second lesson we learn is to be relentless in going after our dreams. If you don't know for sure that you have a dream from God, then when the difficulties come, here's what's going to happen. You're going to begin to waffle. You're going to begin to get shaky. And then if you're not really careful and you're not secure, you're going to turn and walk away. You're going to think, man, it's just not worth it. I can't do it. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe it was the pizza I had last night before I went to bed and not God giving me a dream. I don't know, but I'm not going to go through all this turmoil to, to see that. You won't do what God wants you to do. And so Joseph took off to go and check on his brothers. And we pick up the story in in chapter 37, verse 18. And it says, Now when his brothers saw him from afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Look, the dreamer is coming. Don't you love that statement? The dreamer is coming. Here's what I would like to have said about us, though, in that way. Not, Not the motivation that they had in saying it, but wouldn't it be amazing if people would say, Hey, man, there's the dreamer. There's the one who looks and, and, and says that anything's possible with God. That's not quite the, the motivation that they had in making that statement. But they said, look, the dreamer is coming. Therefore, let's kill him and cast him into some pit. And we'll just tell our dad that some wild beast devoured him. And we'll see what becomes of his dreams then. Man. Isn't that amazing? One of them talked the rest of them into, no, let's not go to that extreme. So the Bible tells us they ended up stripping him of his coat of many colors that his dad had, had made for him and throwing, throwing him into a pit and finally selling him to a passing caravan of slave traders who took him to Egypt and sold him into slavery where he ended up in the house of a man named Potiphar. So much for his dream, right? Can you keep your dream alive when the times of pain and difficulty come? There's a question to write down. How are my dreams doing right now? Are they, are they on the ventilator and, and they on just life support? Are they, they barely hanging on? Are they gone altogether? 
But there are two things written about Joseph in this particular moment in his life that we cannot miss because they are key and they are crucial to our resiliency in these times of challenge. Two things about him. First, he was resilient. Listen to these words from the 39th chapter of Genesis. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of Egyptian, of an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. We keep reading, and it says, And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Wow. What a great description. As a matter of fact, it's the only place in all the Bible where the words successful and prosper occur in the very same text. Now, get this. Where is Joseph when this happens? Where is Joseph when this is, this is noticed of him? When, when somebody identifies God's hand upon his life and the success and prosperity that, that's happening to him. Yes, you're right. He's still in slavery. He's been taken out of his normal routine. He's not living his dream, or so he thinks. His dream seems to be on hold. He had nothing to do with it, but they came, and they took him, and they put him into slavery. And the Bible says that in the time of slavery that Joseph was a successful man, and he was a prosperous man. And you want to know why? I think you do. And I'm going to lay it on you right now. You want to know why? we got a few people in this room. I get to not be here in an empty building, which is great. Not many. We're not over the limit, so nobody worry. I'm going to tell you why Joseph was successful and prosperous. Because you see, here it is. Your circumstances do not create who you are. Right? Thank you. Amen. I love that. Hope you're saying amen at home. Hope you're jumping up and down in your living room. That's right. Stance in a situation right now that we're not crazy about, right? Well, some of you are who've had this lifelong dream just to eat Doritos on your couch and watch TV 24-7. You're happy. You're, you're excited about that. But the rest of us who love engaging in life, we're not. We're in some pretty tough situations and circumstances right now that we don't wish to be in. However... It can do nothing to what's on the inside of us because our circumstances do not create who we are. They don't define us as a person because it wasn't about the circumstances. It's about our hearts. It was about Joseph's walk with God. It was about his character. Boy, doesn't that say a lot. About the stuff on the inside when nobody else is around, nobody else knows, nobody else is looking who we are before God. It was literally about who he was. Listen to me, church. And listen good. Some of you need this. Some of you, this will free you right now in Jesus' name. Listen to me. You have to stop blaming your circumstances for everything that goes wrong in your life. And then notice what he did. Did you notice what it said about Joseph when he was in this terrible situation? Twice it says that the Lord was with him. The Bible says God was with Joseph. And I'm telling you, I promise you, I guarantee you this. That God is with you when you belong to him no matter where you may find yourself at. Whether you're in captivity, whether you're in a bad situation, whether you're in a bad family, whether you're in a bad marriage, whether you're in a bad workplace, I don't care. If you know God and you honor him and follow him and your life belongs to him, then guess what? God is going to be with you right there in the midst of it. If you read this book completely, if you really get your face in it and know this thing, you're going to see guys who are thrown into a lion's den. You're going to see people who are thrown into prison. You're going to see people in all kind of bad conditions. And yet, God was right there with them wherever they found themselves because they loved him and honored him. And he holds true to his promise that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Next, we learn in Joseph's life to recognize and resist wrong temptations because in the 39th chapter, verse 6, it gives us an idea of Joseph's physical appearance. It's just very rare that the Bible talks about how someone looks. The, the description of Jesus basically said he was just comely and normal and just plain looking. I find that hard to believe. I, I, I just imagine that he was just so incredibly radiant. But listen, it says of Joseph these words, that he was handsome in form and appearance. What's being translated in today's vernacular would be that, man, he's hot, right? I mean, because that's kind of the way everybody describes it now, hot or not. 
So, so with Joseph, I, I, I'm guessing he would be in the category of being hot as a guy. So he was, a, he was a man who made women turn their heads, apparently. And the Bible tells us that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, took notice of him and tried to seduce him. And it's an illustration of the fact that there are some things that the Bible tells us that we are never to fight. And one of those is found right here. Did you know that the Bible tells us that we are to flee sexual immorality? That we're to run away from it and not fight it, but run from it, to flee, to get away. I've told people for years that the best defense against this temptation is a good pair of running shoes. Turn your tail around and take off and run from that stuff. So many people today seem to be running to it. I started out in youth ministry, man. We tell the kids that all the time because that temptation is so strong. Here we find a woman physically infatuated with her husband's handsome, strapping, young slave, and she did everything she could to lure him into immorality. But Joseph knew two things. He knew that if he slept with Potiphar's wife, it would betray the man who had invested a great deal of confidence in him, and even greater, it would be a sin against God. Let me repeat that. It's easy for me to say it would be a sin against God. And he resisted and he refused. And when she tried to physically force him into bed, then he ran out of the house, leaving his coat in her hands, the Bible tells us. Because Joseph knew that he was better off without his coat than without his character. Whoa, man, that'll preach. How are we with our character? Are we, are we flipping with it? Are, are we careful with it? Are we, are we taking care of it? What are we? And today, all these years later, men and women, which is evident by what we seem to see on television almost every day, we face the very intensity of temptation that Joseph faced. How are we handling that? Here's the promise we have in God's Word in the New Testament. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But listen to me, church. It goes on and says, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of what? A way of escape that you may be able to bear it, get away from it, overcome it, not give in to it. That's what we have to grab a hold of. We have to understand that there's no temptation that we're going to face. Even if it's that chocolate cake and you're trying to, to do better and eat better and all that stuff, you can overcome it. You can just run away from that, whether it be the bakery or whether it be in your kitchen, run outside, do some laps around the block, get away from it, throw it in the trash can, give it to a neighbor, whatever. There's always a way of escape, whether it's something simple like that or something even more intense like sexual immorality that's knocking at your door. There's a way to get away from it. There's a way to overcome it. God will give us the power, the ability. He will show us the way to move, to move away from it and not towards it if we want that. Joseph wanted it with everything he had. And here's what he, here's what he realized. He realized he would not trade away his God-given dream for anything. I'm going to tell you something. I wish I could come in your living room right now or in your car and sit beside you and tell you this. Nothing this world has to offer is worth forfeiting your dream over. Right? Nothing's worth it. All these temporary and fleeting Good times and and good moments, they're not worth it. Why? Because they disappear. They dissipate. That greener grass on the other side of the fence, it's never even greener. It's, It's fake. It's a mirage. It's the enemy telling you, you'll be better off if you do this. Sell your soul. Give it up. Don't do it. Nothing's worth it. And then number four, don't allow disappointments to derail you. Here's the next chapter in Joseph's life. I want you to get this. When Joseph refused the seduction of his boss's wife, the Bible says she went to her husband and accused him of assault, of sexual assault, of rape. He hadn't done anything wrong, and yet, innocent, he ends up in prison. And I can only imagine how Joseph felt, felt when day after day passed by him. He had been in bondage from age 17 to now almost age 30. 13 years almost as a slave, as a prisoner. He must have felt like giving up and resigning himself to live out his days behind bars and die in prison. Nope. Did you hear that? Nope. That's not what he did. The fact of the matter is this. He still didn't give up. 
And he never lost hope. And by the way, next week, Easter Sunday, you don't want to miss gathering with us online because we are celebrating the reality and the fact of life that hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. So don't miss that. Joseph knew this. Joseph knew that the hope of life and eternity was found in following God no matter what comes your way, no matter what prison you find yourself in. Joseph never gave up, never lost hope, never went back on his dream. I heard this years ago, and it's kind of been a life motto for me. It's always too early to quit. Quitters never win. We've got to hang in there. We've got to hold on to it with everything we've got. We've got to understand that. Hey, listen, I know if I had quit 15 years ago when I went through the worst betrayal and abandonment in my life by some of the closest people in my life, that Connections Church would probably not even be here. And I would have thrown my dreams and my purpose away. Listen, don't quit. Don't ever give up. God is still working it all out in ways we can't even imagine. And number five, I want to tell you, Joseph didn't quit. He was always diligent in his duties. Check this out. One day the king wakes up and he had this set of dreams the night before. This is Pharaoh, the the most powerful man in all of the world at that moment. He had had a set of dreams in the night before that troubled him greatly. And Pharaoh brings Joseph in, and he describes his dreams to Joseph. And the Lord gives Joseph the insight to interpret them. And you know the story, most of you do. It was a prediction of the seven years of abundant crops that were going to be followed by seven years of terrible famine. And Joseph told the king to make diligent plans and store vast amounts of grain for the next seven years to withstand the ensuing years of famine. And I love this. He suggests to the king to select a capable leader to oversee the entire program. So the advice, the Bible tells us, was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this? Referring to Joseph now. He's talking about Joseph right here. He said, can we find such a one as this? And listen to what he says. This is a a godless leader of of the day. This is the most powerful man in the world, but did not know God in his personal life. He he, he worshiped idols and was in, in false religions. But here's what he says. He says, can we find such a one as this? I mean, a man in whom is the spirit of God. Did you get that? Even in prison, even through all he had been through for the past 13 years of captivity, even in the midst of all of that, Joseph never ran away from God. And the Spirit of God is being recognized by the most powerful man on the planet at that moment. Let me ask you this. Do people recognize the Spirit of God in us? When we rub shoulders with them, do they see something different? Do they realize, you know what, that, that, that guy, that lady there, they're not of this planet. Something's different about them. Do they recognize that? Because it was sure evident in Joseph's life. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, and as much as God has shown you all of this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and over my people. You shall rule according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be above you. Woo, man. You talk about incredible. That is powerful. Once again, Joseph moved up the ladder. He was diligent. He didn't stop doing what he was supposed to do, even in captivity. He served with a smile on his face. He had that upbeat heart, that spirit that just wouldn't die, that wouldn't quit, that wouldn't slack off, that wouldn't grumble, that wouldn't complain. He just kept on whistling and singing and worshiping God and doing everything that he was supposed to be doing. Man, we have a tough time with that a lot of times, don't we? The stuff of life kind of bogs us down and we kind of fall prey to that That mentality of, man, woe is me, how bad I've got it. We've got it great. No matter what you're facing right now, you are the blessed of God if you are in his family. Nothing of this world can stop that. Joseph understood that. He moved up the ladder and he got the top job. All the hardship, all the disappointment, all the delays, it was preparing Joseph to literally overnight become the second most powerful man in the world. In effect, the prime minister and governor of Egypt, Listen, too many people bail out during the preparation period. Get this today. Too many people throw in the towel during the preparation period and never see the fulfillment of their dreams. Joseph didn't. 
He wouldn't. He wouldn't be stopped. What about you? Do you quit too soon? Do you quit too easily? Do you quit, period? God's preparing you for something greater. Don't give that away. Don't throw that away. Listen, Joseph literally went from the prison cell to the palace. Don't you love that? Write that down. God took Joseph from the prison to the palace. That is a story worth telling, and I'm going to tell you, that's a story worth living out in your own life. God can do the same thing for you and me today. Our circumstances, our situations will be different. Nevertheless, we face hardship. We face challenges. We, we, we have all kind of stuff thrown at us, and God is still doing great things in and through our lives and wants to take us to great places. He wants to fulfill those dreams that he's birthed inside of us and he's planting in us right now if we will not give up. And if we will realize that the stuff of this world matters none at all. This, this world is, is passing away and everything that's in it. The only thing that matters is God's great kingdom and being a part of that and fulfilling the purpose and the dream in which he puts in our lives to shine his light, to shine his glory, to lead others to this promise, this hope, this purpose, this destiny of being a child of God for all of eternity. We understand that. All the junk of this world, guess what? It just kind of melts away and disappears. And we know that there is a higher purpose than what we're living for right now. Joseph understood that. God promoted him. God had his hand on him. God was orchestrating all of this all along. But, but that's not the end of the story. In the next couple of minutes, don't, don't turn away. Don't leave us. You've got to hear this. There's one more crucial part. <laughs> kind of remember where we all started with the brothers hating Joseph, with the brothers deciding they were going to kill him, then changing the plan and, and, and selling him into slavery? Well, they come back in the story because Pharaoh did just that. He, he gave Joseph the job of being over all the, the, the land and, and, and orchestrating the, the, the good years and then the, the hard years to follow. And when the hard years came, everybody was hungry including Joseph's family, his father, his brothers, and, and his younger brother that had come along since Joseph was gone. And, and, and here's the thing. The father told the older brothers, go, go to Egypt and see if you can get us some food so we can survive. And little did they know they were going to encounter the brother in which they had sold and given away to ask for that food. See, here's the clincher. This is the end of the story that is so important. When they get to Egypt, they are brought before Joseph, the brother. Joseph recognizes them right away, and he, he makes an excuse to go into another room, and then he finally gathers himself because his heart is so, so mixed up, his emotions, but, but he gathers himself, and he walks back in, and he faces those, those brothers that sold him, that almost killed him. And he begins to interact with them, and he kind of begins to question them about their family and, and what's going on back home. And, and they reveal to him, and something's percolating inside their heads. They're beginning to, to realize something is going on, but they're not quite sure. And then all of a sudden, the moment comes when Joseph can hold back no more, and he begins to weep. And he put his, his aides and his, his workers and his, his servants out of the room. It was just him and his brothers, and he began to, to look at them and weep and, and talk with them and tell them, I am your brother. I am Joseph. And the first thing that happens with them is they begin to fear. They, they're afraid. They're thinking, okay, man, revenge is going to happen now. But we're, we're dead now. I mean, he's, he's the second in command in all the land, and, and surely he's going to pay us back. But here's the thing. He did pay them back with the thing that God requires of all of us, the thing that he's given to all of us over and over and over and over again. And look at me, don't miss this. Hear me right now, wherever you're at, either today, later this week, next year, next month, whatever. Joseph chose to forgive them. Wow, you got to be kidding me after all of that. Absolutely he did. And he told them, he goes on and shares with them, listen, the thing you meant for evil God used for good. He put all of this into place. He, he kept his hand upon me. He led me every step of the way, even in the prison cells and even in Potiphar's house. Wherever he took me, God had his hand upon me. I did not quit on God, and he never quit on me. And because of that, I can stand here today and tell you I forgive you. 
The Bible says they were reunited. I'm, I'm sure the brothers were just overwhelmed, just amazed at God's love pouring through their young brother now. And, and all of it made sense. The Bible says he, he told them, go get dad and go get our younger brother and bring them and let's be together as a family. That's the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness can erase and restore. Listen, I'm not telling you that those that have hurt you and those that may have abused you and, and treated you terribly and, and all that, I'm not saying that you have to reconnect with them and reunite and, and, and live happily ever after because there's a chance that they won't do that. There's a chance that maybe they're going to abuse again, they're going to hurt again. So don't put yourself in a, in a situation where you can be hurt again in that way. But, but at the same, same time, don't hold a grudge and don't let bitterness grow in your heart. Forgive them, pray for them, whatever you have to do. God can help us. Listen, he's brought me through that. I knew a time of hate in my life. I knew a time of just, just utter hatred and, and, and just revenge, wanting to get back. And, and listen, all that stuff was like a cancer. It just eats you up. It destroys you. But when we forgive, we open the prison door that we've been in and we walk out free. Joseph forgave his brothers. Amazing. And, and as we close in prayer here in just a moment, I want to share this with you. There's one even greater than Joseph that came over 2,000 years ago to forgive us of all of our sins and all of our unrighteousness and to set us free. He's the one that came to birth these dreams in us and, and live them out through us. He's the one that laid down his life for us. And as we celebrate Palm Sunday today with those around the world, that's exactly what it's all about. The coming of Jesus into Jerusalem, knowing that he was about to lay his life down on that cross at Calvary and spill his blood for the redemption and the cleansing of our sins. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's the, the ultimate forgiveness right there. So a couple things we want to pray for right now. Number one, if you need Jesus to come and forgive you, set you free, come into your heart and life, be your Lord, be your God, be your everything. I want to pray for you here in just a moment. If you, if you need to release somebody to forgiveness that you've held a grudge against, that you've, you've held on to bitterness, that you've held on to those things that, that they've done to hurt you, I want to pray for you today that you'll allow God to help you forgive, help you release them, help you change that and free your life from, from that grip of unforgiveness. If you've been in a place where you've had a dream from God, where you're on fire for him before, and you know who I'm talking to out there, you know very well this is your life that you've had that dream in your heart, in your life, and it just beat like a drum. You couldn't get away from it, but, but for whatever reasons, maybe the hard times came, and they're going to come, and every, every dream is going to be tested. And I'm going to tell you something else. Every dream will be tested multiple times. Even in the beginning stages of this church, Connections Church, over 10 years ago, we've had people come in, and people be apart, and people get mad, and people leave, and, 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 and for the wrong reasons. Because we're about the kingdom of God, about connecting people to God and to each other in fellowship in Christ. But I've seen it come, and I've seen this dream tested over and over and over again. But guess what? You can't kill it. You can't stop us. Because we understand that this is a God thing. And listen, the thing that's been birthed into your heart and your life all those many years ago, or maybe just months ago, or maybe a few days ago, I believe it's a God thing. And maybe you've kind of given up on it already. It's resurrection season. And the beauty is it's always resurrection season with Jesus. And he's here today to revive and restore, renew, and resurrect those dreams that he has planted in your heart, in your life. And one last thing, maybe, maybe you haven't connected to your dream yet. I want to pray for you right now that God's purpose, God's dream will come alive in your heart, in your spirit, that you'll see it, that you'll feel it, that you'll know it, that you'll hear it, it'll be clear, powerful, and it's not always pastoring a church, as a matter of fact, be thankful it's not, because that's not always easy, is it, Tim, but there's nothing like it, 
when it's your dream. So would you pray with me right now? And would you let us know in the comment section and go to the website, connectionschurch.church, and click the button there that, that you're making a commitment to Christ or God's changing some things in your life, reviving your dream, whatever it may be. Lord, thank you. Thank you for meeting with us today, again in this format, again where we're not able to be together physically, but we are together. God, you are uniting us together, and we are keeping us together. That bond that cannot be broken is you. God, it's you in us, all of us who call on your name, who love you, who serve you faithfully, God, who are in your family, who are the children of God. And your bond will not be broken, God. So until we meet together again physically, we meet together in this way. And we thank you for that. And for those that, that, that may have said today or saying right now or praying right now, God, come into my life. You be God. You be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins, God. Make me a son or daughter of the Most High God. I commit my life. I repent of my sins. I call upon you. I believe that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you are now my Savior, my God, my Lord, my everything. For those who have walked away and are coming back right now, just, I know you welcome with open arms. We see that in the story of the prodigal. You're waiting. You're, you're relentless. Your love never gives up. God, thank you. Thank you for new life in Christ Jesus today. For those who who maybe have never connected their dream right now, God, that's becoming alive in them. That's, that's exploding in their hearts and in their minds right now. I believe that. A dream for your great kingdom for such a time as this, God, that you're going to use them in incredible ways. You're going to work in them and with them and through them, God, to change their world. Man, I love that, God. I see that lived out all around me every day and the, the lives of the men and women and, and people I get to do, do ministry with and do life with. And Lord, I speak to those who their dreams have been battered and beaten. And right now they're struggling. <laughs> I speak and breathe and believe and pray resurrection, renewal, revival, God, right now. That those dreams are getting up as we sang today. That you use dry bones to, to create an army, God, that nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing's impossible, God. You are the God of all things. And Lord, today, you're renewing those dreams. Father, we honor you. We thank you. Let us be a blessing this week as we march into Easter. This coming week, God, I challenge every Christ follower, not only as a part of Connections Church, but as a part of the Big C Church all around the world, to raise the anthem, to raise the banner high, that blood-stained banner that Jesus Christ gave his life for us, that he, he died on that cross, but on the third day, he was raised to life just as he promised he would be. Thank you. That is life, period, that we would all do everything we can to get the message of resurrection life out to everyone we can in the days ahead this week and beyond. Thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for your great love your great salvation, your great dreams. We bless you, we honor you, and we thank you, and we worship you. And everybody said together, amen and amen. Thank you for being with us. The team has some parting words for you. Pay attention closely. We can't wait to connect with you every day this week. Be blessed, see you soon. Thank you for tuning into this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.